Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Lord be with you. And also with you. My name is Peter Johnson. I, I feel like I've been here before, but I've been in that room over there many times. Uh, but uh, it is my honor and privilege to be with you this morning to worship, certainly to worship with you, um, which is something that unites us together in our way. Very good. Uh, you know, nothing hinders the Holy Spirit when it comes to worship, whether you're wearing a mask or you're watching on Zoom or Facebook Live or you're sitting here right now. Nothing hinders the Holy Spirit. And during uh, these past seven months or so, which have been crazy, um, none of that hinders the Holy Spirit either. Um, our lives have been filled with uh, this sort of confusion and craziness, but the Holy Spirit is also able to hold us up with joy. The, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It doesn't mean we walk around with a, you know, fake smile, but there's something underneath us that holds us up in spite of any sorrows we may be carrying as well. So, our call to worship is from Psalm 90. Listen to these words, verses 13 through 17. Listen to these words that come from the Word of God. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. Let us pray. Holy God, you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy, blameless, loving children. In Christ, we find we are also called to be disciples. In Him, we find out who we are and what we are living for. As your holy children and disciples of the Messiah, Magnify the truth of your holy gospel that we may find true freedom in the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace and God of glory. Scripture says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let us confess our sins. Holy God, we love Jesus. We bless you for your grace and your mercy. We come to you knowing that we have left things undone because of slothful attitudes, ignorance, and stubbornness. Forgive us. We look to your Holy Spirit. Renew our minds, O God. Invigorate our hearts. Quicken our souls to the heartbeat of your word. 
that we may move and be moved accordingly. With all our stumbling into sin, we still, still commit ourselves into your forgiving and loving hands. Oh God, we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has ascended, Christ is coming again, we are forgiven. He is our vision. First scripture reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Uh, Methodist Bishop Will Williman, professor at Duke Divinity School, said the Gospel is God's means of God, of getting, uh, God's means of getting what God wants out of us. And Matthew one of Matthew's themes is the authority of Jesus. Who has authority? Matthew 28, 16 through 20, the very last verses of Matthew's gospel makes it very clear who has authority. Hear these words from Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. That is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. And if we could have one word for this text, it would be resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11, the words of Paul the Apostle. Now I would remind you, he writes, brothers and sisters, of the good news of the gospel that I proclaim to you, which in turn you received, and in which you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Um, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for your work among us as you bring your word alive, heart and mind, in conviction and in action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if uh, you grew up in the 50s and 60s and you lived in this tri-state Connecticut, New York, New Jersey area, and you watch Channel 11 WPIX in the evenings, you may have uh, watched Captain Jack McCarthy. Anybody here remember him? Popeye the Sailor Man? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Popeye would get into trouble in those cartoons. There was Olive Oil and Pluto, his nemesis. And of course, Wimpy. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. And little Sweet Pea. Popeye would get into trouble. He'd grab somebody to either hand him or he'd somehow get a can of spinach, pop it open, take that spinach, his muscles would pop out, and he'd get himself out of trouble. Usually it's with Pluto, right? And he'd get himself out of trouble, but then he'd sing that song. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Two, two. I am what I am. Well, no spinach for St. Paul. He says, I am what I am because of the grace of God. Now, whether we've known Jesus from the cradle or we've had a Damascus Road experience like Paul or somewhere in between, we've come to know Christ as our Savior. We are who we are, each one of us, because of the grace of God. The all-sufficient grace of God. Saved by grace, kept by grace, grace is going to bring us home. Amazing grace. Now, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we are encouraged to grow, that's why we read the scriptures, that's why we have Bible study, most importantly, that's why we gather for worship. We learn we are also disciples of Christ, students. That's what disciple means, a student of Jesus. We hear those words from him, follow me, follow me. They mean as much to us today as they meant to Peter, James, and John, and the rest. How did you get here? You must have heard it somewhere along the line. You wouldn't be sitting here today. Now, myself, I was baptized a Roman Catholic, my family, and maybe like some of you, no matter what uh, denomination you grew up in, if you did, maybe when, like me, like when you were a teenager, you kind of wandered away. I certainly did. However, when I was about 20 years old, I got hungry for truth. I, I was like a prodigal, famished, famished. My soul was famished for truth. And I began seeking the truth. But little did I know that the truth was already seeking me. I stumbled upon the Jesus people. Remember the Jesus people? They were out in California there in the late 60s and the early 70s. They had long hair, blue jeans, 
you know, the whole uniform, it kind of looked like me. I thought, what's going on out there? But then there was my mom, a real Jesus woman. There was a crisis in my family, which forced my mom, kind of forced her, let's put it this way, it pushed her into joining a women's prayer group that met weekly. The way she put it was, she gave her life back to Christ again. She did that when she was a little girl, 12 years old, in a Baptist church. My brother, younger brother, had a schizophrenic um, uh, episode when he was 18. Came on him. First psychotic episode. He was hospitalized. Well, it was a terrible, terrible thing in our family. My mom joined this prayer group. As she and her friends prayed for their families, she also became the house evangelist in our family. Well, all of a sudden, there's tracts. You know what tracts are? Little pieces of paper, you know, four spiritual laws, or are you saved? Here's how to get saved. Suddenly appeared around the house. And Bibles, where there weren't Bibles before, were on end tables and coffee tables, you know. And there were conversations all of a sudden. Uh, let's say arguments about, you know, the Jesus this, Jesus that, the Holy Spirit. I'm like, oh, come on, Mom. You get a little fanatical here. But then there was this seeking the truth. And one December, about two weeks before Christmas, 1971, suddenly I was listening very closely. Very closely. And I don't remember, to tell you the truth, what scripture she was speaking or saying, talking about. But something happened. And I look back now, and the only word I can use is revelation. And all revelation means is unveiling, scales taken off my eyes, because suddenly, listening to her, it became perfectly clear to me that Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was alive. The, the resurrection became an existential reality. Suddenly, I believed with my whole heart that the resurrection was real, that Jesus was alive, which made the scriptures suddenly very much alive. This book, alive. And those words from Paul, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything has become new. A new world, a new person, a new future, and all according to the scriptures. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 means. All according to the scriptures. Lewis Galloway says, Knowing Christ creates a new center of existence, a new power for living, and a new perspective from which to view all things. Little did I know that the Jesus road, where it would lead me. My journey on the Jesus road took a radical turn. If you would have told me that as a 21 year old, I would wearing a, be wearing a blue uniform with a badge as a correction officer at the Youth Correctional Institution in Annandale, I would have laughed you out of the room. But there I was determined to change the world for Jesus as a correction officer at the Annandale Institution. Hey, correction officers have a hard job. We need to pray for our prisons and our jails, our officers and those inmates who are in jail. So many times that first year I wanted to quit. In fact, I was told the first year is the hardest. And that's the truth. Plus, my personal life, hey, just because you know Jesus doesn't mean everything turns out, you know, beautiful. It's a, life continues to be difficult. Life never stops being difficult. My personal life as a young 20-something was a mess. But grace abounds. Grace abounds. Sam Wells 
Anglican theologian says, we can make mistakes, we can be selfish, foolish, like the disciples being slow to trust in Jesus. Matthew 28, he's getting ready to ascend to heaven. Some doubted. We're in good company. The real challenge of faith is to believe that nothing, nothing whatsoever, he says, is finally wasted. And I would add, in the economy of God, nothing is wasted. You believe God has an economy? He does. In other words, God uses everything. Successes, failures, ups, downs, sorrows, joys, everything. He uses everything to form us into Christ-like beings, into persons who look a lot like Jesus. See, our human stories become sacred stories when touched by the Jesus story, when captured by the truth of the gospel. Let me say that again. Our human stories become sacred stories when touched by the Jesus story, when captured by the truth of the gospel. That makes each one of us unique and all of us together the body of Christ. That's where our unity comes from. Not in politics, not in economics, in Christ. After four years working at Annandale, another turn in the road. Didn't expect it. I thought that would be my career. No, nope. back to college. After college, I uh, uh, graduated from Oral Roberts University. Went to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, great evangelical seminary. Earned a degree there, a master's degree there in New Testament. Went to my first little church in, in New Canaan, Connecticut, a little country church, Calvin Hill Community Church, for nine years. And then left there and, I don't know, how do I say it? I was an ordained Baptist minister, felt the itch to move in a different direction and move towards the Presbyterian Church USA. And as my Presbyterian friend said, I finally saw the light. <laughs> and I ended up at a big church there in Darien as one of the uh, pastors on, on uh, staff. I had about 1,500 people in that church. Um, great experience for me, learned a lot, moved into the Presbyterian Church while I earned a Master of Divinity at Yale Divinity School. And that's when I came up to Denton after that, 2003. I tell you, 30 plus years of ministry are behind me. I don't know where it went. And in that time, some tremendous ups and downs, and including the uh, sickness and suffering and death of my first wife. The Denton people surrounded me, loved me during that time, suffered with me, and um, I'll never forget them for that. But you know, that was in 2013 when she passed, and I met another woman later, 2014, married her in 2016, and it's a new life. And we had a baby granddaughter this past week, Brielle Dora, named after my second wife's uh, mother, Dora, is her, her middle name. You never know what's going to happen in your life. Uh, but I thank God for the grace that accompanies me, accompanies you, accompanies all of us on this journey. We are who we are because of the grace of God. We are called to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as we walk with Jesus. It's a journey with Christ. Where do we find this energy to do it? 
I'll tell you, there were Sunday mornings at Denton where I didn't want to get out of bed. I know you probably had some of that here. Well, Garrett Green says the church is the school of the imagination where we learn to think, feel, see, and hear as followers of the crucified and risen, always crucified and risen, Messiah of Israel. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We are sinners saved by grace that Jesus wrote that Jesus road has taken me on another journey that I'd like to share with you, another personal journey. My grandmother, Dixie Hyathan, Tyson Langston, bless her, was a Georgia girl. Dixie, a Baptist, lived up to her name. After my grandfather died, my mom's dad, Nanny Langston was my mom's mom. She came to live with us because uh, my dad had died. Uh, my mom was a widow with six kids. Her mom came to live with us. And every once in a while, my grandmother would declare her belief in segregation. She was a Georgia girl. I love her, but she was a Georgia girl. It's 1966, I'm 15 years old. The news was reporting on a Martin Luther King speech. And out of my beloved grandmother's mouth comes these words. I wish God would strike that man down dead. My emotions do a double, I'm 15, but still I, I know, I, I know Dr. King is a man of peace. Hey, I'm no angel at 15, all right? I know the words that come out of my mouth about people. But I know Dr. King is a man of peace nevertheless. Why is she saying this? You know, my little brothers and sisters are sitting there too. But then again, almost all the white people I know do not like Dr. King. In fact, they hate him. But I remember also my first count at the Youth Correctional Institution of Annandale. Second day there, I'm handed the board where I have to walk down the aisle in a dorm cottage where there's bunk beds on this side and bunk beds on this side. 60 inmates, 30 on each side, standing in front of their beds. And it's my second day and my heart is beating like this. Because I have to walk down, make sure everybody's there and know who's not there and bring that board back to the head officer and say, well, who's there, you know, who's not there? So I walked down that aisle down one side and back up the other and got back to Mr. Long, Ed Long, the officer, and I said, sir, I have no idea who's here and who's not here. <laughs> he just laughed and said, don't worry, I do. But my heart was like this, why? Because it's my second day, why? Because they're criminals? They, you know, did stick-ups and armed robberies? Yeah. But there was a deeper reason. All of those black and brown faces. I have to confess that. Martin Luther King in Montgomery, Alabama. They threatened to kill his children and blow up his house. You remember that? He wrestled with his fears about all of that He's very, in the house he lived in. And he prayed and he writes about it. He said, I discovered that night I had to know God for myself. He said, I bowed my head. I will never forget it. I prayed a prayer and I prayed out loud that night. I could hear a voice saying to me, Martin Luther, Stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and I will be with you even until the end of the world. I heard the voice of Jesus, he says, saying to fight on. Now, I, I, I quote him, 
because there is a cost to discipleship. There is a cost. Martin Luther King Jr. paid the ultimate price, as many disciples have over the centuries. And people of Jesus, people of Jesus, racism is a discipleship issue. It is a discipleship issue. We know, deep down in our hearts, that slavery was the fruit of racism. America's original sin, as an economic institution for, what, 150 years or so, it infected, infected our democracy. Like a virus, like another virus. It mutated into Jim Crow laws, segregation, voter suppression, real estate redlining, social sins directed specifically at people of color. Now what has that to do with us today? There's a foundation core scripture. No, the scriptures that appear throughout the book that pop up. Now you all have favorite scriptures, I'm sure. We all do. But there are also core scriptures that pop up throughout the, the book. And here's one of them that appears at the head of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Jim Wallace says, our scriptures and our democratic principles call all of us across all of our racial diversity to both personal and social responsibility in fixing the sins our nation was founded upon. My question, does the gospel have power? Does Jesus have authority? Key questions for us today. We can do this. If the church fails to join this struggle now, we cannot beat the church. Forty-nine years ago, Jesus put me on this road. Amazing grace. Since then, the gospel has opened up a whole new How about you, Hopewell Presbyterian Church? How about you? We find ourselves in a place of risk that will challenge the status quo. Will we jump on board and continue this journey with Jesus? Will we walk First of all, these people that we've named, we know that you know each one, each circumstance, uh, every pain, every sorrow. Um, we pray that uh, those who are attending these folks, you will give them insight and uh, um, into their, their conditions so that they may move towards health and healing as we lift dusty to you and the uh, recovery from COVID. Oh, Lord, there are so many in that situation, but we pray particularly for, for her. We lift Jean to you and the rehab that lies ahead and the loneliness that she is feeling. Holy Spirit, touch her today. Touch her this morning. We pray for Rita as she uh, is going to have that surgery. May it be a success. And Michael, who recovering from the accident, Lord, be with him. 
Father, we just thank you for the eternal, living, saving word that in Jesus you have spoken and continue to speak to us as human beings. Do not allow us to hear it only as a cursory, in a cursory fashion, but to hear it with obedient minds and hearts. Do not let us fall, but remain near each one of us with your comfort and between each of us and our fellow human beings with your peace. Let dawn continue to break a little in our hearts in this church at home with those who are dear to us in this city, in our nation, and throughout the whole earth. You know the errors and misdeeds that make our current situation once again so dark and dangerous on all sides. Let a fresh wind blow through it that might at least scatter the thickest fog from the heads of those who rule this world, but also from the heads of the people who permit themselves to be ruled and above all, from the heads of those who make public opinion. And have mercy on all of those who are sick in body and in spirit, the many of whom life is suffering, those who are lost and confused through their own or others' fault, those who have no human friends or helpers. Show our youth also what true freedom and genuine joy are, and do not leave the old and the dying without the hope of the resurrection and eternal life. But you are the first who are concerned about our sorrows, and you are the only one who can turn them to good. We thus can and want only to lift our eyes up toward you. Our help comes from you who made heaven and earth. Therefore, we boldly pray that prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. serendipitous grace fill you to overflowing this day and every day go in the peace joy and love that God gives you in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen, Amen. get out of here yeah. <laughs>